Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Please take some time and check out our evaluation. Let us know if you've used any of the information you've gained from our show. You can reach us directly. You can call Karen at 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. Or you can reach Dan at 740-695-1455. That's 740-695-1455. Hello, Karen. Hey, Dan. Welcome back to mid-January freeze. Mm-hmm. At least, you know, the ground's frozen this week. Right, the ground's frozen and it looks like winter. And uh, I'm kind of happy about that because I like winter. But uh, I, I know that it's difficult for some and I hope everyone has safe travels if they have to go somewhere and all that. But yeah, here we are. Winter has finally arrived in the Ohio Valley. and. January is almost over. I mean, we're 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 past the halfway point. I know, man. Before you know, it'll be 2025 again, or 2025 <laughs> again. It'll be, it'll be it'll be a new year again, but it'll be 2025 once. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, I guess whenever we start a new year, we talk about starting new plans and investing in new ideas, right? And so one of the common things uh, that we have is people are like, all right, this year, I'm going to start my farm. That's right. I'm going to start my homestead. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And whatever reason you have for starting a new farm, starting a new homestead, starting a new business, you know, it could be something that you bought a few years ago, It could be something you've always had could be something you just purchased with that intent in mind. I think one of the best things to understand about that is it can be complex, but one size does not fit all by any means. It's one of those things where it's great to have advice from everyone, Mm -hmm. but don't think that because it worked for one person, it's going to work for you. You know, there's just so many different types of agriculture. There's just so many different types of businesses that will relate to agriculture in some way. You know, and and farm and agriculture, I'm going to use those interchangeably for this. But one size does not fit all and different models, different timelines for profit. Obviously, you have to have a profit. Otherwise, you're not sustainable. But you can do that in different ways. And it doesn't have to be year one. Sometimes profits take a little bit more time than others. Um, And some inputs cost more than others. Some people take loans, some people don't. But I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And another major thing to keep in mind is family farm. I think one of the biggest differences in farms and most businesses and jobs is that uh, you are not only changing your home, you're working from home. There's just a lot of personal investment, personal values that go along with a farm. It's very important from the get go to figure out who's on board, who's not, what works for people, what doesn't work for people. And if you are not willing to sacrifice vacation, well, that does put you in a different category. Not to say that you can't do anything, but there might be certain things that will probably not suit your lifestyle. What I'm alluding to is a lot of animal husbandry. Those do require kind of daily checks for the most part to do them well and to do them with animal health in mind and and to take care of the animal, take care of the land. You're probably checking them daily. So just keep that stuff in mind. Right. And I'm just going to throw in here that this doesn't necessarily limit people to a rural environment. When we think of agriculture, we think of big open spreading farms in Iowa and Indiana, but in West Virginia, we have very small farms. 
some farms as small as a quarter acre. And in urban areas, we even have farms that are productive on city lots. So just because you are not in a rural area doesn't mean you have to give up that dream of a homestead or a small farm. And to be productive, you just have to be able to know how to put the resources together to make something happen and be willing to put the work in. When you're talking about farming, like Dan was saying, there is a lot of time investment and a lot of personal investment. And you do have to make those choices early on. And so the good part about that is that's usually when you're in that dream stage where you're just imagining what's possible and you know you can start to get excited about hey I'm gonna grow this and I'm gonna can this and I'm gonna sell this and I'm gonna process this and and I'm gonna you know do all of the things right and so as you get those things down you start you know you make a list of all the things that you really like and what you want to do and what you're what you're uh I guess ideal vision of your property is you know what do you want it to be and what do you want your life to be like and you just really think about okay I like to go to Florida once a year or you know I don't ever want to leave my property again I'd rather not talk to a human if I don't have to <laughs> there, there are many different types of people in the world and you need to figure out what type of person you are and I'm going to back up again, Karen. That's what I do. I like to back up every time, every time we do the show. That's what we, keep, we, we, we go in circles, don't we? <laughs> but let's define farm because I, I think this is a very interesting topic. So if you look at the United States Department of Agriculture, so the USDA definition of farm is any place producing $1,000 worth of products in one year. And by this definition, as Karen was saying, it could be really small. It could be very large could be soybeans it could be a greenhouse it could be fruits and vegetables it could be forest products it could be anything it could be chickens you know you don't need large acreage to have chickens to do eggs to do uh, broilers and and sell meat so one thousand dollars is the usda definition of a farm agricultural products is what they're hinting at but the irs definition of a farm is if you Cultivate, operate, or manage a farm for profit, either as an owner or tenant. A farm includes stock, dairy, poultry, fish, and truck farms. It also includes plantations, nurseries, ranches, uh, ranges, and orchards. And you are going to complete a Schedule F, so a Form 1040, by this definition. So what's interesting to me is that the IRS doesn't necessarily indicate a monetary value for farm like the USDA does. And that, you know, those are the big guys. When we get into Ohio specifically, and this might loosely apply to West Virginia as well, Karen, but at least in Ohio, the Ohio Department of Ag does require farms to hold regulatory licenses in different uh, farm operations. But this isn't necessarily mandatory, but pesticide applicator licenses, if you are using certain products on your farm, on your land. But if you're selling things like trees, if you have a nursery, it does require a nursery license. Sometimes you have to look at townships and you have to look at the county because there might be zoning issues. You might need additional permits. So remember, when you're when you're starting something up, go from the local level up because, you know, you don't want to go the other way because it's a, <laughs> I guess it's a lot of work and it takes time. And then you don't want to run into an obstacle like right like at the local level where you can't do it. So I'd recommend starting from the bottom up and do that approach. Another important one that I don't think everybody knows, especially if they're starting out, if you've been farming your whole life or if you have a lot of acreage, you probably know this, but there is something called the current agricultural use evaluation program to reduce your property tax on agricultural land. Typically it's 10 acres or greater, the land has to be in the ag use. You don't have to be the farmer as long as somebody is farming it. Or if you do own the land and you're farming it, that qualifies as well. So it's 10 acres or less than 10 acres if you have a gross profit of $2,500. And that's really going to help you out too. So if you have, if you're really intensively working three to five acres and you're grossing over $2,500 a year, then you can get a reduction in your property taxes through your county auditor through this program called the Current Agriculture Use Valuation Program. 
It's a great program. It's backed by Farm Bureau. They do such a great job with this. But again, I'm kind of going through this because, you know, you'll see that there's a lot to think about. And there's there's national there's national requirements, state requirements, county requirements, sometimes township requirements. Sometimes there's city ordinances that you have to work with as well. So I always think it's better to work from the bottom and work your way up because, you don't you know, a lot of times um, things get more restrictive as you go down. So if you if you're able to make a farm or to have a farm and, and if you have zoning issues, at least you'll know it right away. So you're not wasting your time doing everything else. And then you boom, you hit a roadblock. So so make sure you try to work the other way. Work with your extension offices, no matter where you are, they can help you out. Um, a lot of times they they know, you know, they know what goes on is at the local level. Yeah. And, you know, so this is especially true if you are inside city limits. We've had several issues where in the city of Wheeling, you are allowed to have chickens, but you have to apply for a permit, no roosters, things like that. However, there are people that have gone the other way around and got the chickens first and then they get cited they get a fine and then the city is less eager to give them a permit for those animals because typically at that point there's been some complaint or something like that and so go the route where you get the permit first and then get your farm up and running because it is really disheartening to invest and get some chickens start get some egg production and you're feeding your family and you're super excited and then the city comes in and says sorry you have to get rid of these chickens now because there's been a complaint and you don't have a permit so it's really frustrating and while the state of west virginia is a right to farm state meaning that we have a law on the books to protect and preserve our agricultural productive operations from the infringement upon agricultural lands and agricultural occupations by other uses and occupancies. Basically, you know, to put it really simply, agricultural production is a legacy in West Virginia. We have the largest number of small family farms, family owned farms, uh, as any other state. So the law is there to help protect that legacy of the small family farm. And it does give some rights and protections. And when Dan was talking about definitions, using acreage and things like that, West Virginia doesn't necessarily set a minimum acreage for their definition of farm. And so as long as you have a production from your farm that you are actually producing something, then you are considered a farm. Now, where you could get into trouble is if you register yourself as a farm, just so that you can get that lower tax rate. And let's say you're not producing anything, you just wanted to have some horses and enjoy that rural lifestyle. If you are not actually producing producing something, then you can get classified in what's called a hobby farm, which then doesn't give you that reduced tax rate. So there are places where you have to be careful in what you're doing, what you're producing in order to get that lower tax rate for agriculture. Is it called CAUV over in West Virginia, Karen, or do they have a different name for it? No, that's yeah, it's just called agriculture here. (laughs) <laughs> OK, well, I mean, I mean, in the CAUV is specifically for the property tax reduction for agricultural land, but it's it sounds like that's what you're hinting at. And and yeah, there are there are audits for that as well. So, you know, just mm-hmm. just do what's right. I mean, it's it's there to encourage agriculture. But, you know, if you're taking advantage of the system, you know, there are audits in place that will eventually catch up with you. So so do the right thing. And on that note. As a beginning farmer, and I kind of hinted at this earlier, but you have to identify your foundation and that is like why and what you believe in. You have to figure out what you're passionate about, because if, if you're starting off, chances are you probably fall under the category of small farm. You probably also have a job and your spouse probably also has a full time job. So it's hard to do a full day's work, come home. And keep working unless you have a passion for it, unless you believe in it. A lot of times, I'm not going to say that 
you know, it, it can't be done. But if the whole family's not on board, it makes it a lot more difficult to achieve because you are basically working where you live. It's becoming your lifestyle. It's becoming your identity. And, you know, I, I don't say this as, you know, it's not, it's not meant to deter anybody, but it is a lot of work. I think the word small, people think not a lot of work, <laughs> but but small can be very, very busy too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. In fact, oftentimes the smaller the farm, the busier you are. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good point. I mean, it's, if you're talking about uh, row crops and machinery, you know, a lot of times these enormous farms out West do these row crops, you know, they're, they're kind of seasonal guys. Sometimes they have a lot on their plate. They're year round farmers. And when they're busy, they're busy, but it's not an, it's not necessarily every day of their life busy. And so a lot of times if you're a small farm, they, you know, they might be doing stuff year round, especially if you're diversifying and you have d- different types of products, you're doing produce, you're doing fruit trees, you're doing, animals you're doing some chickens you know you're you're year round working whether it's summer fall spring winter so there are going to be times you're going to be busier than others but you're always going to be working so my point is do what you believe in and it works best if the whole family's on board right and so when you're getting to this you know you're like okay well i want to make sure my family's on board what's the best way to go about this there is a SARE publication called Building a Sustainable Business. And you go through that publication and we'll put a link in the comments. But as you are planning, you know, task one is to discuss your values. You know, what are your values and how do they affect your planning and management decisions? But also, what are your family's values and get everyone to put down their values on paper, whether they be their personal values or their values surrounding the business, what is important to you? And sometimes it's not as clear cut as that. You know, sometimes it's a pretty vague question and it's going to take you some time to really put effort into determining, well, you know what, what really is important to me? Because it's sometimes those things that are the most important aren't at the surface level and you have to dig down a little bit to like, oh, hey, I want to make sure that I raise my kids in a positive environment or I want to make sure that I stay connected to nature or, you know, there are a lot of different values, personal values that people have that form the foundation of their farm management plan. And that is really where you need to start. So identify your values, identify your family values, and then find the common values between you all. So everyone's going to have slightly different values. We're all individual people, just like we're all going to manage individual farms. No two are the same. And so you need to find where you meet and also understand where you differ. So that when push comes to shove and things get hard, you guys can always go back to, okay, these were our foundational values. Are we still meeting them? Does this particular farm product or farm task support our core values? And if it doesn't, that can help you be able to filter things out later and take things off of your plate or avoid putting them on your plate to start with. Absolutely. Very important. And what Karen is hinting at is values, missions, and goals. When you're looking at values, your values are going to remind you of why you're in business in the first place. So like Karen said, if you're looking at a family farm, it's not only your personal values, but it's also your spouse, your family's values. And all that's going to feed into what your mission statement is. And that's going to describe who you are and what you hope to achieve. And with a mission statement, we're giving you some direction of where you're going based on your values and why you're passionate about doing what you're doing. Your goals are going to set the miles. You're going to have to set goals and your goals are going to set the mileposts that will help you get what you want. So when you have that business plan in place that are based on your values and your mission statement or guiding it, you set goals and the goals will help you achieve where you want to be going. 
Um, and it's very important to reassess where you are. You know, we always talk about record keeping, but there's no way to measure your goals and your milestones without record keeping. So you're going to have to keep good records on your operation so that you can grow, so that you can move forward, so you can adjust. But it's very important to make sure you set your values and your mission statement based on your values so that you always have a direction that you want to go, that you're passionate about. And when we talk about values, it could be things like to be honest, to be fair, to be accountable, to do it right the first time. A value could be that you believe in this lifestyle of hard work that's going to be good for your kids, be good for your family. You always want to put out the best product you can. You know, this is a value so that what you're passionate about, you're putting in the best light so that other people can appreciate it as much as you do. Right. And your your values can also be paying down your expenses, putting away money for the future, quitting your off-farm job, <laughs> taking time to rest or vacation, being able to have surplus to share with others in needs. These can all be your values. And, you know, you can think about them uh, as far as your personal, your economic, maybe you have some environmental values you want to build into it. And of course, there's also community values. You know, what role do you want to have in your community? Do you want to have time to coach your son's baseball team? Do you want to work with your local farm bureau or Grange? You know, what are what are the community interactions that you would like to have as a agricultural producer? And, and I love when you said vacation. You know, I want <laughs> I want to take time to take my family to different parts of the world so they can see the beauty of the world, right? You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's a value. And that value is going to dictate what you can and can't do necessarily well on your operation. So really, I mean, your, your values are going to keep you motivated. They're going to keep the lifestyle that you want. They're going to make you proud. And they're just going to guide you as far as what you should be doing and doing it well. And, and doing it well is something that it's always just assumed. But I think, I think here's the economic impact of doing something well. When you have a clientele, a customer, have a positive experience, they will probably tell about five people. You know, that, oh, I just got the greatest eggs from, from Joe down the road. You know, he just started up. They're so good. So such good quality. Um, you know, the, the family really nice family, beautiful land. I can tell they come from a good place. They ha you've had a really good experience and you're sharing that and that's very beneficial to your business. Here's the downside. If, they, if the person does not have a positive experience, they're not going to tell five people. They're probably going to tell 30 people. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's just the way it goes. So doing, putting out a great product every time is very, very important to economic stability. Yeah. If you're in it just to kind of make some money, but you're, you're half hearted into it, it's not going to work out. Um, and, and, and on top of that, I'm also going to say that, you know, hard work and drive isn't necessarily the recipe for success either. You have to be competitive. You have to be doing something that other people are not doing. And it's just the reality, you know, this is why it's important to kind of reassess, set goals, whatever you're doing, set yourself apart from the rest, make yourself something that people want and are willing to pay a little bit extra for you. Because when you're looking at your capabilities, sometimes, you know, we talk about it's always important to make a profit and that's true. And it's always important to make a profit, but you're not going to make a profit if somebody's able to make a profit with doing it for, for cheaper. Just because of the way, you know, the resources, basically you have to be competitive and you have to understand your competition to be sustainable as well. Right. And you had said something really interesting um, back when you were talking about purchasing those eggs. Three quarters of what you mentioned had nothing to do with the eggs. And that is such a crucial part of being a direct farm marketer that people overlook. When people go to a farmer's market to shop, they're not there 
necessarily just to buy a um a dozen eggs they go to the grocery store to just buy a dozen eggs they come to the farmers market to know where their eggs come from to create a local connection to support the local agriculture in the region and make sure that our local food system is functional should grocery stores fail. They have a lot of personal reasons that they go to a farmer's market to shop and they want to know your story. They want to see your kids. You know, they, they want to, and you know, this isn't everybody, but people go to farmer's markets to buy a story. That's what they're paying extra for is that story, that connection. And they're not necessarily just going to buy a dozen eggs. And so if you are, and this goes back to your personal values, that type of person who wants to be on your farm and never talk to another human again, direct marketing isn't going to be your best option because you're going to be miserable having to talk to people at the farmer's market. (laughs) Conversely, (laughs) if you are a people person and you love talking to people, direct marketing is a great option for you. So when you're thinking about what you're going to produce and how you're going to sell it, you really need to have those personal understandings of, okay, I don't want to talk to people or I love to talk to people. And that's going to determine whether you're going to direct market or wholesale market or have someone else market for you. Like say your neighbor is really loquacious and you want to work with them and you set up a, a business partnership where they're the marketer and you're the grower. There are lots of different options out there, but you have to be honest with yourself to start with. Very, very true. Thank you, Karen. And I was and I just and I wanted to say that even if you don't want to talk to people, (laughs) there are storefronts out there that that like to buy products and market them for you. So wholesaling is a great way to to kind of skirt that avenue of direct marketing. Or even consignment markets, you know, there, there are like we have one here in Wheeling, the public market, they're a consignment market and they will sell your product for you in their little storefront and they just keep, I think it's 20% of the, the sale price. So depending on how much you hate talking to people, but you still wanted those direct value or the direct sale prices, then that may be another option. That, that's right. So many avenues to, to go down many models to follow and like i said one size doesn't fit all but the passion is something that cannot be negotiated that you know that you have to have the you have to have the passion and you have to be competitive but there's just so many different ways to do it thanks for listening to extension calling this show is a collaboration between osu belmont county extension educator dan lima and wvu ohio county extension agent karen cox If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.